Yay, welcome everybody. Welcome back to my channel, Emma Desi. And as always, if you haven't yet, hit subscribe, hit the little bell and make sure you get notified when I have another amazing interview like I have for you today with the two-time Daphne du Maurier Award finalist, Katie Richards, who writes pulse-pounding romantic suspense and thrillers. Katie was born and raised in the Maryland suburbs just outside of Washington, D.C., a writer since a young age. After college, she earned a law degree and worked as an attorney and a legal instructor for 15 years, but she never stopped writing fiction. And she currently lives in Toronto with her husband and two sons. So welcome, Katie. Kia, how do you prefer to be known? Thank you for having me. Um, either one, it's, it's fine. The cake stands for Kia. <laughs> so, um, either is fine. Kia is good. <laughs> Lovely. Well, well, we'll stick with Kia. That's nice. Um, so I do always love to ask my guests, you know, tell us about your journey to writing because everybody's is always a little bit different. And my experience with interviewing women particularly is that it's quite a, a scenic route that we that we're trying to get there. <laughs> Yeah, and I agree. Mine was mine was quite scenic. Um, so I I, I started as ch as a child, um, as you mentioned, reading my bio. Um, I think the first thing I wrote with well, the first story, complete story, <laughs> I wrote was uh, when I was eleven, um, and that just kind of bloomed from. Um, my mom was an English teacher, and my dad loved to read, so we were always reading in our house. Um, and then one day I just kind of go, I can do this, <laughs> you know, as kids, <laughs> as kids do, it's not so hard to write a book. <laughs> so I, I wrote a, I wrote a story. Um, and so that's sort of the first, where the first writing and I never stopped writing, you know, um, never completed <laughs> as a child. I mean, you have more than that story, but you start writing and you forget and you start up again. And mm -hmm. so, but I kept writing, um, and then, you know, went to law school, did, it, it still wrote, but a little less because, mm -hmm. you know, now life is kind of <laughs> taking Yeah, over. busy. Yeah. Oh, yeah. You get busy, um, had, you know, got married and had children and kind of still was jotting down ideas for the book when I had time and I could come back to it. Um, and, you know, as the kids got a little bit older <laughs> and uh, I went back to work, I would write uh, um, on my phone. In, in the notes app um, on the way to work and on the way home. And that would be my, it was about 45 minutes to an hour train ride each way. And that would be my writing time. And that's the first sort of complete novel, unedited mess of a novel that I finished. Mm -hmm. But it was great because then I knew I could finish one. <laughs> yeah, that, that's, that's, you know, that's the key, isn't it? Right, exactly. Now I know, okay, you can finish a novel, it, you know, finish the first draft of a novel let's say mm -hmm. um I never did come back to it and edit it <laughs> or try to get it published but I did finish it um and um then subsequently a few years later my husband got a job in his uh native Canada and so while I was waiting for um you know all my, my permanent residency so I could work and all of that your kids were in school all day so I said yeah I'll actually let's sit down and write, you know, this book that you've been planning for all these years. And that was Pursuit of the Truth. I wrote it and I thought, you know, if, I don't think it's terrible. And, you know, you're you're 40 now. If you want to if you want to get published, you got to actually try. Right? <laughs> They're not going to knock on your door and ask you if you want to be published. No, so, no, that, that's so interesting. That's exactly yeah. the same as me. I was knocking on my 40th birthday is a dream I'd always had and I just thought if you're ever stop talking about it you've just got to do it now or let it go and move on and right. do something new so oh, that's interesting it's something about you know that 40 or you know whatever age it is for you that goes it listen <laughs> you know you don't have forever are you going to do this or are you just going to talk about doing this <laughs> yeah, yeah exactly wow so a, a couple of things I'd love to just pick up on there um I love the fact that uh, you wrote your first book on your phone during your commute. And I, I really want to sort of highlight that to our listeners, to our viewers, to just to sh show that it is possible to write your book on the go with people around you um, in little bits and pieces and just 
you know, it's little bits here, little bits there, making the most of the time that you've got. Because that is yeah. the time is something that a lot of people say, I don't have the time yeah. to write a book. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's the time is always that's the hardest part, right? <laughs> to find the, the finding the time, especially if you're doing it and you're a little older and you have a family and you have a career, it's it's tough. Mm -hmm. Um, so that that was the time instead of like sleeping or just sitting there daydreaming or reading or whatever. That was the time that I set aside and diligently wrote, you know, the book. Mm -hmm. um, and I still, I think at the time it was out of necessity, um, writing it on the phone. It was just easier than pulling out a piece of paper while you're sitting there <laughs> with people next to you and writing. But um, I still write on my phone because I, I found that it kind of frees you in a way that sitting at the computer, you know, you open up that page, it's lot of white space and you're like okay you have to be brilliant but if you're just typing on your phone it's like that's the place where I put my grocery list and I like jot a quick you know note to myself to remind myself to you know pick up the kids whatever or you know you have to go here before you head home and so there was no pressure because notes on your phone don't have to be brilliant they just have to to get the job done and that's what a first draft has to do too it just has to get the job done uh -huh. the editing part which is like ugh, I, I don't love editing <laughs> that's where you have to kind of make it into something so I think doing that that first novel on the phone taught me you know a really important lesson about my first drafts and just getting words on the page. You can't edit anything that's not on the page. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you got to do that part first. Yeah. So. yeah. That is wonderful. And I, what I admire about that as well, the fact that you still do it is that that's a trick that works for you. You can trick your brain into thinking, Hey, this is no big deal. It doesn't have to be perfect. It's just part of my day and it right. takes the pressure off. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. I love that. The other thing I wanted to pick up on what you were saying about your journey to writing, and we we chatted a little bit about this um, before we started recording, is how often, well, certainly I've discovered this, and maybe you have with the the writers you've met as well, that it's it, it's when, often it's when something shifts in our life. So either we retire, we get made redundant, uh, we move city or we move country or whatever. There's something that just breaks that status quo, much like in our fiction, something breaks that status quo and it allows us and frees us up. And we decide, OK, now is the time to write that book. And so Absolutely. having that, I, I, what, I think it maybe is big sort of coming out of routine and it just facilitates you thinking a bit differently than. Yeah, yeah I mean, I think COVID did that for a lot of people. Right? <laughs> a lot of people changed jobs, changed where they lived, how they lived, what, you know, what, what they were, what goals were in life, whenever you have sort of these life changing moments, whatever they may be, that's when you go, okay, do I really want to be doing this? <laughs> yeah, if I really want what I have, do I want something else? What are, what are my goals? And your goals change during life anyway, right? So um, yeah, I mean, I, I, I think that's quite, normal I know a lot of authors who retired and then <laughs> they became you know prolific authors um, they always wanted to do it but now they have the time yeah that's it well maybe the lesson here is to anyone listening who hasn't yet done it give up your job <laughs> move country <laughs> do something that just changes, changes the way maybe you think. think it through I don't want to encourage anyone <laughs> to just toss away their life but um, yeah, you know, it it never hurt. I, you know, my husband is the steady one, the steadier one. I think he 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 would, you know, he keeps me grounded. While I'm the one that's like, let's move to Spain. It's like we don't speak Spanish. What are you talking? No, <laughs> you know, we can't just move to Spain. Uh, but I I would change, you know, every every uh, ten years or so. Yeah. Um, and I have an uncle who who once said to me, every 10 years, I reinvent myself. And I remember that because I'm like, that's great. That, you know, that's mm -hmm. kind of what, what that resonated with me. Mm -hmm. But uh, I think, I think those of us who reinvent ourselves many times probably need someone to <laughs> pull us back down to earth every now and then. Yeah. <laughs> so. No, there is that. There, we do need that ballast, I think. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> 
So you wrote that book, the very first one on the on your commutes, and you you didn't do anything with it. And I I would that's the kind of book I would describe as the apprenticeship book. We need a yeah. few of those sometimes to help us find our feet with it. Absolutely. But you didn't stop there. You kept going. And not only did you keep going, but you've actually secured a contract with Harlequin Books, which for a lot of romance writers, that is the the pinnacle. You know, that's where they want to be. So tell us how that came about, because that's it feels like you didn't just write a book and hey, it was happy. Yeah. Well, after I wrote the book um, and it's kind of on a whim, <laughs> like I said, something to do in that period when I was waiting. The, the idea when we first moved here was I would. uh go back to legal uh teaching legal writing um but I, I had to wait for all the paperwork to be done and uh so I wrote the book and I didn't I thought maybe I would self-publish but I didn't really have a plan other than something to do with the day <laughs> and I wanted to write and I like writing so that was something to do um when I wrote it when I finished it I thought this reads like a harlequin and I had been reading harlequin since before I should you know young young girl well before I probably should have been reading harlequin um and so I said you know it reads like a harlequin maybe they'll be interested in it and harlequin is one of the few um that their series line is one of the few um publishers who'll take from unagented um authors so I you know I submitted it to them I thought the worst case scenario is to say no. I, you know, it's not. So, some of the manuscripts I wrote, I, I wouldn't show anyone. They're kind of embarrassingly badly written. <laughs> At least I know that now, right? <laughs> but but I wasn't embarrassed by it, so I sent it off. Uh, and then COVID hit, <laughs> literally like a month after I I sent it off. Mm -hmm. And um, it passed. Sort of, they say you're gonna. They would get back to you with a yay or nay or maybe in three months and three months pass and four months pass. And I thought, okay, well, that's a no, they don't <laughs> want it. But it was just COVID um, had slowed everything down. Um, and I was just beginning to think about self-publishing mm -hmm. um, because I, 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 in the writing of the first book, um, there was a, a second character I thought oh, he would make great and maybe this could be a series so I had started on that second book and I and I, I'd heard you needed at least three books to self-publish so so I'll do the three and then if I haven't heard from Harlequin I'll self-publish they got back to me you know at the right when I was finishing that second book and said uh, we love the first one we think this could be a series have you thought about that and I said well <laughs> actually I just finished the second book <laughs> <laughs> so, music to their ears yeah so I ended up selling two books at the same time because they said well send it let's see what happened you know let's see let's see what it looks like and they like that one so I got uh, a two book contract which is unusual for the, the first contract to be two books just right off the bat um but and then started on the third one because they they wanted a third so that's how the West Investigations series came to be <laughs> wow you make it sound so easy I'm so jealous oh gosh it was not easy <laughs> I, I don't I don't want anybody to think it was so easy but um you know there were steps to take mm -hmm. that made it easier um and, and then you know sort of in the interim I had entered we talked a little bit about my ebook Mm -hmm. um, it's, it's, just before we go on to that if you don't mind Kia I'd mm -hmm. just love to know a little bit more about the Harlequin oh, um, sure. side because from what I've heard about Harlequin is they have they they do have a certain style and a certain way of storytelling that works for them and that they encourage all their authors to use so did you naturally have that in your book because you'd been reading those stories for so long or was there quite a bit of an editing process between them saying yeah we'll take your book and, and publication day no, the, it, it there wasn't really much of an editing process on that first book there have been there's been more editing on subsequent book but but the first one I think it, as you said because I had read so many Harlequins mm -hmm. it just fell into that um what they wanted and and as I mentioned when I finished I said this reads like a Harlequin <laughs> because I had I had read so many yeah. it just that was the natural way that I wrote it um but yes they do have a very 
structured. Um, they, they know what they want and they have kind of a structured policy. And you can see what that is on their, um, if you go to the Harlequin website and scroll down to the bottom, it says like right brush or something. And you can okay. look at what that what that is. That worked for me. I mean, maybe it's the lawyer in me. I like the structure. <laughs> um, you know, every not everybody likes that. But mm -hmm. I like knowing exactly what they were looking for. And then within that, I can be creative. Mm -hmm. But I don't have to kind of guess like, oh, are they going to like this? Is this what the market wants? Is this what, you know, mm -hmm. for me, especially in your writing and, and those first con that first contract where you write, you don't know if that two, three months that you've been writing or however long uh, writing the book is going to pay off into anything because you, you just don't know and I didn't I don't love that part of the industry the, <laughs> the sort of like one day this is hot and then the next day something else is and you spent six months writing a but now b is what they're looking for mm -hmm. um mm -hmm. you know that for me it was comforting that yeah. Harlequin was like this is what we're looking for it's right there you don't have to guess oh uh -huh. yeah but I know other authors are like no that's way it's way too confining I like to be creative and you know I want to write what I want to write and only what I want to write and I don't feel like they're telling me I can't write what I want to write so I should say that yeah it's just that you know the parameters of what they're looking for yeah I think you've exemplified beautifully there how no matter what genre you're writing in or what style you want to write in you need to know the genre and that's why mm -hmm. genre exists you know yeah. it gives us those parameters as you say I think that's a great way of putting it but no matter, you know, no matter what genre you're writing in or what kind of story you're writing, you need to know what readers want from that particular genre or style. And that's why it's so, so important to, to read within that and read extensively within that. And then I think what happens then is just what happened to you through osmosis. You kind of take in that style, the pacing, the rhythm of that type of story, those things that are really hard to describe and explain. Yeah, you just naturally feel it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you just kind of know that that is, you know, now, <laughs> excuse me. Yeah, but poor Kia, she's just recovering from uh, <laughs> the latest round of COVID. <laughs> round of COVID, yeah. Um, I think uh, what happened to me is that it became a natural thing. So, you know, sometimes I'll get authors or readers to ask, you know, how do you know when the pacing is right or when because it's romantic suspense so it's half mystery half romance how do you know when to switch from the romance to the mystery or how to blend them together or whatever and it's it, it's hard to tell you mm -hmm. <laughs> you know th th that's the creative part right that there's no formula for that <laughs> it's just having read enough I I'm when I'm writing I'm like uh, I'm getting tired of reading about the mystery now I need some of the romance mm -hmm. so mm -hmm. then it's you you blend the romance in you know but you can only learn that by reading a lot yeah um, and the, the other question I get a lot is how how much how many Harlequin books do you need to read um now as I mentioned I was reading them since you know teenage preteen years so I've read thousands <laughs> you know you probably don't need to read for 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 20 years first <laughs> but you, you do need to read, you know, hundreds, yeah, at least a hundred to get, first of all, to, to kind of learn the style of Harlequin, but then also to learn the different styles within. There isn't as much as there are parameters. You know, my books are not like, not exactly like, um, you know, Denise and Whitley's. They're not, they're not like Barb Hans. Like there, there are lots of different, um, ways styles of writing within um mm -hmm. the harlequin framework yeah so it's finding your what you enjoy as a writer and then exactly. and making it fit but yeah no brilliant i think that that's just a great message for people to know you do need to read what you write and sometimes yeah. that can take a bit of time to figure out but it's, it it's really and you have to keep doing it because it it changes you know i'm constantly <laughs> reading and writing that's the two biggest time consuming things that I do but that's part of your job as an author yeah what a great way to spend your day and what a great job to have I, love it. I know my, my son's always like you're always reading I'm like well why, I'm working, why, 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 darling, I'm working. yeah 
<laughs> so you we before I interrupted you, you were going to tell us about your standalone book, Kill for You, and the interesting thing that happened there. Yeah, I was just going to mention that. Um, so how I kind of things converge. I I wrote Kill for You. I can't remember now which one I wrote first or second, but it's kind of overlapping. Uh, Kill for You and Pursuit of the Truth. Both of those kind of came to me like I knew what those stories were and it didn't take me long to write them. Um, and I submitted Kill for You. I'd submit, shop it to a few select agents and nobody wanted it. And then um, during COVID, um, a, a, a ebook imprint was um, taking... Uh, just open submissions from anyone and um they they um I, I submitted it they liked it they bought it um it kind of came it came out the same year as pursuit of the truth which is you know uh doesn't happen that a debut author gets two books of the, in the same year um and then it was um the imprint well, well not just the imprint um a, a section I, I can't remember exactly how it all went down but a section of that included my imprint of that publisher was bought by a larger publisher and uh it it, it went away pretty pretty much <laughs> um and so that was and that wasn't great that wasn't a great feeling but I think a lot of authors have that something happens you think oh great you know I'm finally on the train, the career train, and it's and 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 it's moving forward, and then something happens. Yeah, the publishing industry is it's wild. <laughs> There's always something new happening, and something changes afoot. Um, and so that you know that was that didn't feel great, mm -hmm. but um, mm. I just mentioned it because you have to be willing to kind of roll with punches. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I, I think, it, yeah, you do. I think that is really, really true. You're right. The traditional space is changing. It's kind of in a big, big period of transition where it's trying to keep up with fast the faster moving indie space. But yeah. just a bit of, um, so your book was bought by um, a publishing house. That publishing house was then bought by a bigger publishing house. Right. And when that happens, the people, the house that buys the smaller one, they take the rights of whatever books are being right. held by that smaller house. And it's they're not obliged to follow through with the contract and follow through with publishing. Yeah. So, so it, the book was published. It's out there. Oh, um, it was. Oh. Yeah, it was published. I I, I, they did publish it. I mean, they had paid for it by then. So <laughs> I guess, <laughs> I guess why not? Um, no, they published it, but um, you know, it, everything changes. You know, maybe your editor doesn't no longer wants to work for the new. You know, doesn't want to work for the new thing. At, you know, at any time, just like any any other company, when uh, when that buys another company, everything kind of mm -hmm. is in flux. Yeah. Um, and so, and it was um that imprint was starting just starting to publish mysteries so it wasn't like it was already um uh, uh, a a a that the, the mystery side of it at least wasn't um wasn't grounded uh, yet mm -hmm. so it just sort of went away <laughs> and that and that that was not great but um you just it's one of those things that happens and i i've heard many stories similar yeah to that yeah, me too. Yeah, where where agents leave and then so you're dropped by the agency. Right, right. Yeah, yeah, it, it does happen. And so I'm sorry that it happened to you, but I'm so glad you're able to share that with the audience just to kind of prep them that these things do happen and it's a it's a volatile world. Right. There. It's it's <laughs> very volatile. It's very volatile. So yeah, you just have to keep keep rolling with punches and <laughs> you know. Resilient. Um, Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I'll say that, you know, publishing that book led to me getting an agent. And so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't for naught. It just, it maybe wasn't meant to be the sort of bestseller jumping off point. That's yet to come. That's that yet to come. You know, it was to be. <laughs> yeah, I, I hope so. <laughs> so I guess, so. well, not I guess, I know that this means you write under two different pen names. Yeah. And um, how do you find managing both of those brands? Do you see them as two different brands or are they, how do you? They, I see them as intertwined. Um, 
uh, I, I mean, since there's only one thriller, it's not really that hard to manage. <laughs> the, the thrillers I write under uh, Kia D. Richards and the, um, or the thriller right now. <laughs> and, the, and the Harlequins I write under K.D. Richards. I mean, I, I could see that potentially train, changing at some, you know, since there's only, there is only one thriller out. Um, I could see, you know, maybe just writing thriller, everything under Katie Richards. But the idea behind it um, to start was that the thrillers are uh, a lot, a, a lot more, there's a lot more cursing, there's a lot more death, there's a little bit more blood on the page, there's um, a, a little bit sexier on the page, because um, there, there, there is a romance in the, in the thriller, but not it's not 50 50 by any means, you know, maybe 20%. Um, so, but I, I, the idea was to give uh, readers just from looking at the name, oh, this is still, you know, KD. So the quality of writing is the same. And if I like KD's writing, I'm going to like Kia D's writing. Um, but it's if I don't like uh, blood, on the page if I don't like multiple murders and you know a, a, a bit more thrillery I can ignore mm -hmm. uh, or I can not read those and I can know right from the 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 pen name what I'm what I'm getting yeah did that you was the plan on writing more uh, thriller did you enjoy kind of delving yeah. into that darker side of yourself I do I like that I mean I, I like the darker side of the characters I like the characters who are don't necessarily have as much of a conscience <laughs> they're willing to be really really bad and and uh and the uh protagonist has to deal with some pretty horrible antagonists and you know defeat evil i, I like the good evil mm -hmm. um that kind of mean i think you know anybody who reads or write thrillers right <laughs> they like good triumphing over evil uh, it. but it's got to be really evil for it to really hit you <laughs> and be and, satisfying at the end yeah and so where do those kind of evil characters come from are they do you just kind of delve into your own subconscious there and what's going on or do you do you use it from things that you see around you or read in the news that kind of thing most of it is from things I see around me in the news but taken to like ridiculous levels right if it's someone who maybe doesn't have a conscience a sociopath or something like that or who just only cares narcissist you know that ha has some sort of issue yeah. <laughs> that keeps the you know uh, it keeps them from from uh managing in polite society so it usually starts kind of with the antagonist because that's you know mm. you gotta have a good foe you have to have someone who's like they just don't care about the rules <laughs> and, and, and that's what makes the thriller right yeah um and then you have the opposite with the antagonist, you know, maybe they just want to be left alone, but, but for whatever reason, they are called to um, deal with this, this evil. And they're the only one that can, that can save the day. So Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's interesting that you start with the um, antagonist and have the baddie there, because I have to admit, it's something that is an ongoing uh, kind of lesson for me. It's something I'm having to get better at is go to that darker side and what is a really nasty thing to do to somebody else how dark can you go before it gets too dark um yeah. and I need to kind of pull back a bit it's having that that judgment in myself about what's too far and what's not I'm still struggling with that a bit yeah I know that's always you know for me it's it's always like go a little further so my agent will say oh nice but <laughs> can they can they do this can it be mean or can it, you know <laughs> it's, I don't know it's not she's like it's the it's not uh the stakes aren't high enough like that's you every every writer like, the stakes aren't high enough it can't just be that the person is mean it can't just be like a nasty person it has to be you know high stakes and you can't walk away so yeah um so that's what I struggle with because I mean I I struggle with making it mean enough <laughs> but it is a hard because yeah. we do have to delve into our own I, I've, I've listened to interviews yeah. with um, crime writers who maybe write quite kind of procedural crime where nasty things really do happen to and they describe what happens to the victim um in yeah. the crime book and uh, they ha some of them have said yeah then I need to kind of go and shake things off a bit and I need to do something that's a bit cheerful yeah. I've had to go to some dark places in my head and that's quite a can be quite a scary place to go. Yeah, yeah, that's true. It is. 
<laughs> it is. It's hard. It's hard to do that. <laughs> so you have a very busy life. You have um, you have a husband, you have kids, and now you've got a full-time writing gig as well, yeah. which is wonderful. <laughs> How do you manage all of that? You know, what might a typical day for you look like and a typical writing day where you manage to get everything done? I know not every day is the same. Yeah but no <laughs> I never managed to get everything done so that that's part of the first thing it's it's you you I just I just don't manage to get everything done you know if everyone is alive and eaten and you know relatively unscathed it's a good day <laughs> so so that is so that you know I try to take the pressure off myself that way hmm. um but it, typically you know I'm up by six thirty. I try to have, you know, an hour at least of like just slowly. I'm not a morning person. So you notice I didn't say I get up at four and write for three hours. No, that's I've never done. I tried it for a little while and it was like horrible. <laughs> that is not going to happen. Unfortunately, I'm not a night person either. I'm usually like in bed by 10. So it's like it's everything has to be done. <laughs> but um, so I get up, I kind of ease and take an hour to ease into the day make breakfast have my coffee watch the news um then the kids get up I get them off to school um my kids now are thankfully they're teens and preteens so they're old enough to basically handle it on their own I just have to make sure that they focused <laughs> <laughs> but um and then um you know, usually while they're getting ready, I'm kind of organizing my day. What do I need to do? Am I editing? Am I writing? Um, do I have kids stuff that is going to interrupt during the day? You know, that I, so I, I just organize. I figure out what my time is going to look like. What realistically can I do? And mm -hmm. then I usually have a like, it would be great if I could also get this done <laughs> thing. But that's the extra pat on the back. Yay, you know, at the end of the day, if it gets done. Um, so I'm, I organize, then I get them off to school and I come back. Um, and if I don't have anything other than writing to do that day, I start writing. At nine to three, I write. With a break for lunch in the middle um, that can last depending on how, how the writing is going, if I'm in a groove, I, you know, I might write and eat at the same time so I don't break <laughs> my, yeah. my concentration. Other time I need to break <laughs> concentration because things are not going well. <laughs> so your know, lunch may run for an hour and a half and I take a walk and try to like get away from the writing. So if I come back, I can be better at it <laughs> than I was in the morning. Yeah. Um, so it, it's, you know, the amount of time of actual writing, editing is different. And I should say, it depends what stage I'm at in the manuscript. So if I'm at a, if I'm at the beginning stages of, you know, I, I, I haven't actually started writing. I'm researching, thinking about plotting and, and outlining because I'm an outliner. Mm. Um, you know, I'm at the beginning of a new book. Um, it's a lot more kind of staring at the wall and daydreaming, and, you know, letting it, figuring out what the plot's going to be and a lot less physical writing. But I, I consider that writing. I mean, that's part of the process. So that is writing, that is doing the work. Um, and then, yeah, about three o'clock, I have to stop. I try to like cleanse a little bit and then go get the kids. Um, dinner, all that homework, all that stuff. Um, and I try if uh, I need to, want to feel like I have the energy to do a little bit more at the end of the day of, of writing, buttoning things up. Um, if I've had to stop in the middle of a scene, maybe if I could finish it, <laughs> you know? Yeah, yeah. Um, so just try to kind of round out the day at the end. Yeah. Um, oh, that's, lovely. That sounds yeah. like a great day. I yeah. I want a day like that. Um, I, I totally agree with you that that thinking, what I call mulling it over, that that right. is, um such a big part of the writing process and um I was talking to somebody else about this uh, and how I've heard lawyers say you know and you're from the law as well so you know um they charge I'll charge you three hundred dollars because I was thinking about your case that day you know I'll, I, I bill for that hour because the thinking time is just as important and right. we don't question that when it comes to a solicitor or a lawyer 
So why do we question it about ourselves as writers when we too, and we're creating something from nothing. So of course yeah. we need to think about it and give it time to that mulling it over and thinking about it. Um, Absolutely. So I, I'm really glad that you, you mentioned. And you have to do it at multiple points. In, uh, and I, I struggle with that, right? Because at the beginning part, I'm like, yeah, it makes sense. You can't write something you haven't thought about it. But then when I'm editing, sometimes I'm like, you should be able to just edit this and get through 80 pages today of editing. And it's like, no, you have to think about it then too, because something that was seemed brilliant when you were, you had no words on the page, you now have words on the page. <laughs> it might not be quite as brilliant <laughs> or the way you wrote it might not be brilliant. Or, you know, it, it, I, I I do extensive outlines, but then sometimes your characters do whatever they want to do and what happened on the page does not look like the outline. So now you have to fix the ending and, you know, the or the beginning or something. So it's just to say that there might be multiple periods where you have to mull <laughs> the, yeah. the story. Yeah, yeah. So well said. And then your editing and writing. So... I think people get curious about this, especially if you've got maybe more than one project on the go, which I, it obviously works for you, but I generally don't advise newer writers do this, stick to the, stick to the first one. But when you're kind of doing both, how do you, um, do, are you able to do both actually? Or do you find that when you're in the first drafting stage, you stick to the first drafting. And then when you're in the editing stage, you stick to the editing. Yeah. Or do you find you're able to swap between the two over the course of a day or a week? I prefer <laughs> to stick with, if I'm in the first draft, to stick with that draft until I get to the end. Mm -hmm. um, I even prefer to be able to do the first edit of that before I do anything else. But the reality is, you know, now I'm writing books under contract and I'm writing thrillers that aren't under contract. And so, um, uh, and, and uh, you know the lag time for books is quite long so I'll finish I'll finish a book and it won't be published for a year but it has to go through copy editing and then proofreading and maybe even develop developmental edits before you even get to copy editing yeah. and then I'll be finished another one while that one's in proofreading it'll, it'll come back to me for proofreading so I don't have the luxury really of um of just going, <laughs> I'm gonna work on this one manuscript and that's all I'm gonna do for the next six weeks or three months or whatever, however long it's taking me. Um, so I have to, mm -hmm. um, I, I try and I would, you know, if you are a new writer, not under contract, I would say stick with one, one till the end, mm -hmm. that's it. And that's what I did. Um, when I was writing, when I, did, I didn't have a contract, I wrote that first book and that's it. I didn't write four books at the same time. <laughs> I mean, even before, you know, I, I, I wrote Pursuit of the Truth and then Kill for You, or it might've been the other way around, but I wrote one, I finished it. They wrote the next one. I, you know, they were back to back mm -hmm. um, without any break, but, and, and without knowing that one was gonna be published um, or the first one was gonna be published without a contract, but I didn't do them at the same time as a new author. Mm -hmm. um, so I definitely would not, if you can do it, I wouldn't say for anybody, don't, don't do it. <laughs> don't do multiple. Um, it's, it's easier now to do a draft and then, you know, maybe my editor will send me um, copy edits. I'll stop the draft because usually you have two, three weeks to get those copy edits. I'll look at the copy edits and then let it mull. I'll go back to the draft. Uh, the first draft and then um, you know have our figure out however much time I'm going to need to do the copy edits mm -hmm. and then go back to the copy edits but I, I usually do one at a one at a time I may jump you know I may be doing one on Tuesday and something else on Wednesday and something else on Thursday but I don't do on the same day I don't work on two different manuscripts it's okay. too confusing yeah yeah <laughs> I, I would find it so to jump from one world into another and get into that those two different people's heads that, that would be tough yeah yeah um so so thanks for sharing all of that because I, I find it fascinating I have no doubt other people will find it interesting as yeah, well everybody's so different <laughs> yeah yeah um so you it feels like you're quite a confident person when it comes to your writing and your writing career 
Oh gosh, uh, no. is that true? <laughs> and and how did you get to that point? Of, no, you know, no, no, no. I think um, any writer or creative person, right? You're kind of putting yourself, part of yourself on the page, even if you're completely different from your characters all the time. I'm all the time going, oh God, this sucks. I suck. I'm a horrible writer. Nobody's going to want to read this. This is going to be the book that everybody realizes that I am a sham. And, you know, there's just, I, I don't know how you can stop. I don't know how you stop that voice. I think we all have it. Mm -hmm. um, I'll go do something else, <laughs> you know? Um, it, I actually find it easier for the Harlequins to get over that voice because I'm like, you know what? You have a contract. Write the book. Let you know. Let your let your editor tell you you suck. <laughs> and she's never once. <laughs> she's a lovely person. I mean, your editors don't tell you you suck. But like that's how I train my brain to get out of that. Right. Yeah. If it's horrible, they won't print it. They're not gonna. You know, the publisher's not gonna print anything that's terrible. That's so so write the book. Right. Mm -hmm. So that that's how I get out of that. <laughs> right. Um, but sometimes you need to just walk away from it. It's yeah. too it's you know, you get to I'm writing a, a thriller now and I'd set it aside for about three weeks because I was pushing myself to finish, finish, finish. I want to finish by in August. And then that was another sort of pressure on top of like, it's got to be brilliant. Right. <laughs> and so it didn't get finished by August because it was just too much pressure. And I set it aside. I say, whatever, I'll come back to it. I already set it aside a couple of times. <laughs> but sometimes you get too, too invested in it. Yeah. And you just have to pull back. It, it's, it's kind of weird because you need to love the story to write it, right? But you also, if you love it too much, you can be, you can just fall down that rabbit hole where like, you're spending hours trying to figure out, you know, a great, a good synonym for happy. And it's like, just write happy and move on. <laughs> you, know? Yeah. you know, it's just like every word is not going to be brilliant. <laughs> You've got to yeah. stop, you yeah. know? Yeah. And often the first word you come to is often the right one because it's instinctive. Yeah. It's just coming from you. Right. Okay. So, yeah. And no, it's, it is, I think you're right. That inner critic, that little voice that we have in our heads, everybody has it and we, we have it for a reason it's there to protect us but right. it's it's finding a way to and um, whatever tricks we give ourselves whatever works it's finding right. a way to kind of acknowledge that we have that self-doubt and we worry that someone's going to yeah. figure it out that we don't know what we're doing <laughs> but then right. just think well I've got to do it anyway and I don't it sounds like having that contract kind of helps you it gives you that added added accountability and right so, but I just I've never heard anybody say that before I loved what you said you know if it's horrible they're not going to print it <laughs> right <laughs> don't worry and um if it's horrible they're going to also help you make it better the editor yeah, whether true. you're hiring them yourself or it's within house they're going to help you make it better so I'm I'm really glad you said that I'm going to remember that and, and kind of say that to my my students as well you're but, not you're not alone right you're not out there on the island alone um so you know I have to remind myself that there are people there you know around me to help me make the story better to tell me when I've gone off you know on the wrong tangent uh, or when this character really should be the central character not the one that you're you're, you're writing so you're 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 not alone mm -hmm. even if you're writing indie that you there's usually you know you hire an editor or someone that you trust you have beta readers or critique partners there are people there and, and if there aren't you should surround yourself with people who who you know will tell you who you trust to tell you mm -hmm. maybe that's seen as not great <laughs> or that scene is phenomenal you know who who you trust to tell you the truth about the right you're writing yeah yeah you are not alone I love it yeah so tell us tell us about you have a new book coming out at the end of December please do tell us something about it I do know so uh the seventh book in in the West investigation series a stalker's prey it is, it is uh, coming out in December. It's already up for pre-order. <laughs> so, so you can, you could get it. And it's, um, it's a stark, a stalker book. Uh, my first sort of with a stalker is the, uh, is the central, but first for West investigations, but a, you know, stalking is the central plot point there. Mm. Um, and, um, 
for those who don't know uh, about the, the West investigation series, um, the the series is about a group of well, a group of brothers run the uh, security and investigations firm, but um, you get to meet lots of different characters, bodyguards, operatives, police officers, sheriffs who who uh, are friends with or become friends with the brothers and and uh, their stories. Um, and so this this story is is about um, a bodyguard who is who's hired by a a former flame. It's a it's a second chance romance. A former flame who's become a big time celebrity. Um, uh, actress and has a stalker and he is the only uh, <laughs> only one she trusts to uh, to 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 uh, protect her but they also have to work through so some of the issues that um, led to them breaking up in the first place <laughs> oh exciting I like that you've got a little bit of celebrity in there some glamour going on as well right <laughs> yeah, yeah but a dark theme again you know with the stalking yeah. and um yeah it's um it's it seems to be something that is ever more prevalent or I'm aware of it more maybe because of yeah. the stories that I write but it's it's not just for not just happening to celebrities happening to um ordinary people ordinary as well people, with, yeah with all yeah, the kind absolutely. Of surveillance the gadgets that are available on people's phones and stuff so very topical as well as having yeah. your glamorous uh, actor and uh, bodyguard. Right, right. And so the uh, you know the the guy who's stalking her is pretty uh, not low tech, but it's just the average guy, right? So he doesn't have uh, um, you know superpowers or anything like that. Um, so it's yeah, it's 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 interesting. I think to to think about like with so much technology and everyone on social media, mm -hmm. there's so much of our lives out there for people who maybe don't have our best interests you know yeah. in, in at heart yeah. yeah so true so true <gasps> oh shivers <laughs> but that's and then that's the beauty I guess beauty horror of uh thrillers it's usually you know no matter how sort of outlandish the thrillers get and and I love that part right you want to make it in, in some ways the more outlandish the the more um separate the more you can separate yourself because you can go oh well that would never happen <laughs> right <laughs> but there's always like a little kernel of like it started somewhere <laughs> it started somewhere that was more authentic and maybe realistic <laughs> yes 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 that um yeah you you've seen it or you've heard it or you know it, it Something yeah similar right mm -hmm. that's the part that kind of gets at you that it could happen like yeah, i don't think it will happen but it could <laughs> And then the nice thing too, then uh, particularly about romantic suspense, is that towards the end, or and indeed thrillers, I think towards the end, it it there's always that kind of happy ending that whoever the protagonist is survives, and you think, ah, oh, okay, it's usually yes. okay with the world. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, in romantic suspense, in anything you know with romance in it. Um, for Harlequin, at least you're gonna have a happy ever after, or at least a happy for now. <laughs> is, what, is what they say too. Happy for now, happy at the end of the book. Um, so that's great if you if you like want a happy ever after. And I tend to like that. Um, I, I I tend to look for an end that's like everything or most of the the most important things are buttoned up. I know some people like things more realistic where like maybe the good guy doesn't win but I'm like I don't want to spend 400 pages and then a good guy loses like that's not the guy I'm rooting for it's like no that's not for me so <laughs> so yeah I, I want you know maybe they should be changed you know everything should be exactly as it was when mm -hmm. they started and maybe they didn't get what they said they wanted or thought they wanted but they got what they needed yeah. you know you know it but it has to be satisfying. It has to be sort of like, okay, yes, I get it. Great. You know, our 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 good guy won in the end, won, whatever that means for your story. Yeah. Um, at least that's how I write. I know there are other writers who are like, no, sometimes I just want them to like lose. <laughs> not, you know, not. I like, think that's the writer way. wants that, not necessarily yeah. the reader who wants that. I, I don't know. I mean, some people do very well with that. And some people write it really well. And you're like, I, I think um I, I think about Gone Girl, right? I mean, mm -hmm. that did amazing. And I love that book. That's like maybe 
the exception to my rule. I love that book. I think about that book from time to time still. And I'm like, you know, <laughs> I wonder if, if it had, you know, in that world, I wonder how that couple is doing because she's nuts. <laughs> she's crazy. Both were, maybe that's why it worked because they, they were both net yeah. horrible people and, and they did get what they wanted in the end. That's true. Neither they... were good. Neither were good. And maybe that's why it worked, right? Because you're like, well, it wasn't like the the I guess the, the Nick was supposed to be the protagonist, the 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 good guy. I guess it's kind of hard to decide, to be honest, who's the good guy. Yeah. And hopefully we're not ruining it for any, anyone. But it's been like twenty years now, right? So. Yeah. It's a brilliant, beautiful <laughs> twist. Such a brilliant twist. Yeah, but yeah, it, yeah, it was like. I, just the ending of it for me, that, those last pages is what, I mean, the twist was great too, right? But those last pages were like, this is, this is not, and it was like blew my mind, the last pages, like, this is crazy. So dark. <laughs> right? But crazy in, a, in the best way, this is like, <laughs> I, I just yeah. was like, I don't know. But that's what I say, I, you know, I talk, I, I, I still talk about it, I still mention it because I still think like, I wonder like now their kid would be a teenager, like what is that? What is that kid like? I, 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 Jillian Flynn should write a sequel. To I like I know. Say that. Yeah. Yeah. I want to know what these people are doing now. But, but that's a sign of a great book, right? When you're still, you know, 20 years or however many years it's been later, you're still thinking about the characters and wondering, like, what are, what's their life like now? <laughs> yeah. Well, I have no doubt your fans will be thinking the same about your books in 20 years' time. I hope so. <laughs> and, and let's hope we can create some new fans today as well. If people are interested in finding out more about your books, where's the best place to do that? I am most active on Instagram at Katie Richards, um, author, Katie Richards author, and um, Facebook as well, Katie Richards author, same one. And then um, my website is Katie Richards books.com perfect well i will be sure to link to those so people can easily find you kia it's been an absolute joy talking to you today thank you so much for sharing about your journey and and what your writing life looks like thank you thank you thank you for having me it's been so much fun